The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Next on the Bronx Journal, Aurora Flores from Son del Barrio, Carlos Sierra running for city council, the Bombayo Youth Project, and singer-songwriter Robert Rios. Watching the Bronx Journal, the BronxNet television edition of the multilingual community newspaper, published by the students and faculty of the Journalism, Communication, and Theater Department at Lehman College. In print and on television, the Bronx Journal covers the issues concerning the people of the Bronx. Do you want to know what's going on in the Bronx? Are you interested in Bronx politics, sports, and entertainment? Are you interested in Bronx personalities? Do you want to keep up with the latest business or cultural trends? In the Bronx Journal, we have the answers. Now here's your host, the Bronx Journal's Editor-in-Chief, Professor Miguel Perez. So what happens when you're an accomplished media professional and you have music running through your veins? Do you turn to corporate America or back to the barrio to make your mark? Our first guest today is now the band leader of a group called Son del Barrio. Does that answer the question? Her name is Aurora Flores and she's with us today to discuss the music that has become her passion. Aurora, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Tell me about this passion that you have for music. I, I know you as a, as a media professional, as a, as a publicist, as a journalist, as a writer. You're still writing books, I know, but what makes you a band leader now? Well, before you met me, 10 years before you met me, I cut my teeth on Latin music. I was the first female music correspondent for Billboard magazine. In 1974-75, at a time when society was changing, women still really didn't go out alone that much, always accompanied. So I broke a lot of barriers that way. And what you didn't know was also that I went to music and art high school. I was a bassist, first bassist in the school orchestra. I cut my first album at 15 years old as first bassist. In a so this was your first love? Yeah. And, but, you, and you did all those things, but you had to come back to your first love? Yes. Well, my first love when I was in the orchestra, and I played classical music, and my father composed songs, my mother sang, my grandparents came every year from Puerto Rico, and my grandfather, he played accordion, and they played plena. And I had another uncle who played cuatro. I had an, another uncle who was an opera singer. So at Christmas time, every year since bomba I was a little plena. girl, it was plena. Little bomba, but mainly plena and aguinaldos. And we'd go, we lived in the projects, and we'd go from floor to floor, <laughs> bringing through, yes, aguinaldos, parrandas, two people in the neighborhood. So this was part of my upbringing. I went into a, my mother took me to a talent show at seven years old to sing Angelito Negro, that Lola Flores song. And I won first prize, so I was very musical. But I was musical until I joined the Latin jazz group at Music and Art, and the guitar player started calling my house and my father picked up the phone. That was the end of my music career. Really? Yeah, I was. They were against it. Oh, yes. As long as it was classical music, he was fine. Once it was jazz or Latin music, or I like Tito Puente, no, it was over. That was it. I was the firstborn child. This was not going to happen. So I threw them a curveball. I went to college and I became a music writer. So then I, I was there, but then I was in the capacity of La Escritora. And, but I still did a few things. My next door neighbor was. Ismael Rivera. Oh my God, wow. To Ismael, I'm introduced to Coltijo, Rafael Coltijo, who introduces me to my roots of plena and bomba. It's Coltijo who teaches me how to dance bomba, and he would tell me, tu eres la, blan la negrita más blanquita que yo conozco. <laughs> and I was really getting into the music. 
and they would let him they would let me sing in their band but chorus. As a, but as a writer um, when you were mostly a music journalist for a while I was a music journalist for about five years okay when you were doing this Uh, and you were meeting all these uh, entertainers and all these people and all these famous people. Did you like say to yourself, you know, maybe I should cross over? When did, when did the crossover happen uh, totally for well, you? Well, I was thinking that way, I was. And then I went with Coltijo one day on a gig and we went to Connecticut to a beautiful hotel and I'm doing coro with Lalo Rodriguez, Imae Rivera Jr. and the son of Daniel Santos, Rodney Santos. So I'm doing chorus with them, and I loved it, and I said, I really want to do this. Then when we get back on the bus, Coltijo tells me, we're going to an after I was in the Bronx, the Cerro Mal. This was 1975. I get in there, and there's no windows. The windows are painted black. And I think almost every drug addict was in there, including two of my cousins. <laughs> and I said, I'm in the wrong place. And I remember after we finished the set, it's three in the morning. And I go to Coltijo, and I have my little blouse with the big tie and black pants. And I tell Coltijo, tú no me vas a dejar la quisola. And he looks at me and says, yo no soy niñera. I'm not a babysitter. I said, oh, I'm in trouble here. So <laughs> when I left there, the sun was coming out. Oh, my God. I was scared out of my mind. When he asked me to go again, I didn't go. So then... They would goof on me and say, Aurora se rajó, Aurora se rajó. She just wants to write. She's, I was scared of it. It was a scary time. It was very salsa at that time. was very male-dominated. And it a lot was, of after-hour clubs were It like was illegal, a testosterone right? club. And not only the clubs were illegal, there was drugs everywhere. There were a lot of illegal things going on. But I learned. I had to hang in there with those guys. And as soon as I got my break, I left. I went to Eyewitness News, I started working for the Daily News, I met you, and then I started doing more of a political beat, more of a community beat, and I was doing all that work, yet when people from the 100 Hispanic women told me, Aurora, do you know any artists? And I told her, I'll bring you Celia Cruz. They didn't believe me until Celia walked because, in because with her again, husband. you had the connections already, you yeah. met all these people. When she saw Celia walk in with her yeah. husband, she was like, how did you, I said, my friends. Celia baptized my son. I mean, these people came to my wedding. They were part of my family. Coltijo came to my house one time when my brother was sick to visit him, to talk to him, to encourage him as a percussionist. So tell me about Son del Barrio. So Son when, del Barrio. When, did, when does this happen that you become a band leader? What happens is that after being in public, after being in journalism, then being a mother and a wife in that order, and then go, going on and saying, I need a a more normal job so I could raise my son, then I go into public relations. And I did well in public you relations. You had your own agency. Yes, for a long time. Yeah. And it was really great. And then my son went off and got married. And I started doing more and more uh, public relations in terms of acts and performances. Mm -hmm. And more people would tell me, pero Aurora, you know how to do this. And one day somebody put a clave in my hand and said, we need a corista, come and do this, and organize my band, and I was doing it so much. And then I started writing songs. Then I started writing for Dora the Explorer. I'm writing songs for Dora. And then I found one of my, I kept diaries during the 70s of that whole salsa era. In one of my moves, I found my diaries, and I found all these songs I had written. And that's when I decided, you know what? I want to do my own band now the way I grew up. When I grew up, if you were a musician, you played everything. You played mambo, guaracha, um, bolero, guaguanco, plena, bomba, bolero, so, even paso doble, which so no one that, plays anymore. Is that Son del Barrio? Do you play everything? Son del Barrio is la zona de los bajos. It's a play on the word, the genre son, mm -hmm. that comes from Cuba, but it's all over the Puerto Rico and Santo Domingo, all over the Antilles, and zone, barrio zones, where we work hard and we party just as hard. That's what Son del Barrio means. So this is Hispanic music of the inner city. Yeah, it's sort of like the music from the streets of Latin New York where I grew up. I grew up in El Barrio hearing all these rhythms learning about all these people. When I hung out with Coltijo and Maelo, they told me that back in the day there were no national barriers like now. That si tú eras cubano y tú eras negro y tú venías a Puerto Rico, tú te unías con otro negro que tenían ese son. When Alcenio Rodriguez 
me cortijo in the palladium. He put cortijo a bomba, a bailar mi bomba, written by Arsenio. Cortijo made it a hit. When Arsenio's in a club in Upper Manhattan, and he hears this Dominican, Santiago Serrón, singing, he tells his brother, Quique, tráeme ese negrito. And mm. Santiago Serrón says, pero maestro, pues todo el mundo lo llamaba maestro, uh, to Arsenio. He said, yo no puedo cantar son, yo no soy cubano. And Arsenio said, ¿qué, qué? Tú eres negro, tú eres congo, tú puedes cantar son. Que nadie te quite la música. He said, let no one put borders on this music. Because when this music belongs to everyone and everyone is hearing it, it has no nationality. And you it know, belongs to no one. And you know, sometimes we hear a Latin song and we think it's from our country. And then years later we find out, no, you know, like I think every song is a Cuban song. <laughs> yes. And you probably think every song is a Puerto Rican song because you heard it in the Puerto Rican community for so many years. You well, think it's your own. Gloria Stefan did a great bomba. Mi tierra. Right. I right. never expected her to do a bomba. And here she does this beautiful orchestrated bomba. All right. Mi we, tierra. We're running out of time, but I need you to tell me about the music. What is bomba? And what is... What bomba is, what, what is, is an African-derived native rhythm of Puerto Rico. It came with the enslaved Africans. It comes out of Mayagüez. And we got to talk about Haiti. Haiti is important, not only to Puerto Rico, but to Cuba. You have charanga, which eliminates the brass and puts fiddles and violin. Mm -hmm. This is very French. And after the revolution in Haiti, a lot of those French owners, uh, slave owners, came with their slaves to Cuba, and they developed this whole music. And then there's the tumba francesa, which is almost like bomba. And the bomba, and we were just talking in the green room about guaca, which is another rhythm found in Guadalupe, all these rhythms. Cuba, we have to thank Cuba, because also Cuba was the largest island with the most slaves. And it was the last island to abolish slavery. I think it was 1888 or something like that. So, so here me, we are. Tell me about these instruments. Most of these instruments before are begin, African derived. I want to perform a little bit with you. I yes. know you're going to teach me something. Our, but before metronomic, you do. our metronomic, the metronome uh -huh. of Latin music is the clave. Of course. The five beat. That's the two, three. Some right. people use right. three. Three, one, two, three, one, two. They use that. Now, in Puerto Rico... You find that beat in almost every Latin song. Every Latin song. Bomba has another kind of beat called a qua, but this is the heartbeat. Then what we have from the Tainos is the guicharo. In Puerto Rico, they call it a guicharo. With a scratcher. Now, in Cuba, you have the same thing, but in Cuba, it's a little bigger. We call it a guayo. You, or a guido. A guido, I'm sorry, a guido. guido, that's what we call it. And yes. you hear this a lot, especially in the charanga. And then you have also the maracas, which were, these are the little ones. But these are the maracas, these are all small instruments. But a quick lesson, I'm gonna start with the plena, okay. because you're a journalist. Okay. And this, they were the original journalists of Puerto Rico. People were poor. There was a newspaper, but they didn't read. So the pleneros, this is mobile. They would go from town to town. This is the base. Uh -huh. They'd go from town to town, and I'm going to show you two rhythms. We're going to stand for this, okay. and we need, we need another David, David, David Fernandez. Fernandez, the David musical Fernandez director. David Fernandez is the musical director of uh, Son del Barrio. Yes. Hey, David, thank How you, are you? Thank How you are for joining you? us. Thank, thank you for being for here. You. And you, you guys are going to show me what to do, right? The small yes. one is the one that sings and improvises. Right. Hold okay. this one. You can hold it right like that. And what you're going to do is you're going to give it two beats, bouncing. Because if you leave your hand there, apaga el sonido. I you stop you. the sound.
too late. Thank you for being on the show, and we'll be back with more of the Bronx Journal, so stick around. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Aurora. <laughs> wonderful. I think it breaks a little to the left. Uh-uh. To the right. Nope. Straight. I told you it was going right. For fun playtime ideas, go online. Just don't stay long. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this is probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool, really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately because time lost is brain lost. Hello and welcome to the Bronx Journal. I'm David Britt. You may know him as a Bronx community activist or from his involvement in the issues that concern you, especially the education of our children. You may know him as a member of the City University of New York's Board of Trustees. But did you know that Carlos Sierra is now running for New York City Council? Today, we are going to find out why. Mr. Sierra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Mr. Britt. Oh, no problem. Now, Mrs. Sierra, I'm just curious, and our viewers are curious as well, what makes you so passionate about education? Well, um, let me first tell you that I dropped out of high school uh, around 20 years ago, and it was the City University of New York, CUNY, that gave me the opportunity to be here today. It gave me the opportunity to excel. It gave me the opportunity to... Uh, to basically have a better quality of life. So I am passionate about helping our children. I am passionate about making sure that we are going on the right path, and that's the path to, to, to our American dream. All right. Now, what life lessons did you learn growing up that brought you to this little career path to trying to run for New York City Council? Well, I, I think that the first lesson is to, is to make sure that, that, number one, we go to school, you know, because dropping out of high school, getting my GED, and then eventually going to college, um, uh, it's a lesson that some of us have, no, some of us go through. We have to make sure that that we don't stay behind. That we basically go to college. That we have access to to a better quality of life through education. Now, it was when you attended Lehman College mm -hmm. that you first became a community leader, correct? Uh, yes, yes, and no. I mean, I've been helping the community for a while. I was once at the, at, the, uh, at the police athletic league helping our kids, but definitely the City University of New York gave me a great opportunity to get involved into community activism. Okay, so in 2008, you were elected chairman of the Bronx Department of Youth. During that time, what did you do? What was your role in that? Well, the, the first thing that we did was to conduct a community needs assessment. It was very important for us to identify the issues that were affecting the community. Um, 
basically what we decided to do was to appropriate uh, close to half million dollars into the different areas where we needed services. For example, um, senior services, we appropriated funding for that particular area, youth services, um, as well as special program for people with disability. Okay, you have children, correct? Yes, I have two. How would you feel about your children going into the education system as it stands right now? Well, um, um, my nine-year-old boy, he's going to a, um, he's going to the, to the, to the public school system here. He's, uh, he's right now, um, he's on fourth grade. And um, uh, honestly, you know, I feel that we can do better. Uh, he's going to a failing school right now. The school was graded D, by the, uh, actually C, by the Department of Education. And I think that um, we have to come together collectively as a community and make sure that we are providing, especially the politician, that they are providing um, the resources that the school needs in order for the school to excel and the kids. Okay. Now, you are also a major supporter of health care, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. What is your view on health care in the Bronx? Well, I'm seeking to represent an area that uh, has been affected by a lot of illnesses, uh, such as HIV, um, people suffering from asthma, people suffering from uh, mental illnesses. And my view is that we have to do a better job. Um, we have to make sure that, that uh, you know, the funding and uh, the right support is, is being provided to, to those people in need. All right. Now, you are a li uh, liaison for CUNY citizenship now. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you do to help immigrants and anybody? Uh, what I do every day is help people out. Um, number one, I make sure that they know that through higher education, they have a path to a better quality of life. Uh, we want to make sure that they go to college. But besides that, we want to make sure that we provide the immigrant community the support that they need in order for them to, uh, to reach the American dream. For example, um, at the CUNY Citizenship Now, we provide free citizenship services. If you want to become a U.S. citizen, you can come to us. We'll help you for free. If you want to petition someone from abroad, we also help you for free. Okay, then. Are you part of any other organizations? Uh, yes, I'm part of the um, NAACP as well as LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens, and the NAACP as well. All right. And uh, what do these organizations do for the community? Uh, for example, through the um, LULAC, uh, we have an um, education council. And what we like to do is that we like to make sure that people know about the different free services that are being provided uh, to, uh, uh, for free in the community, uh, such as free English classes, uh, such as um, free citizenship classes. Um, and also, through the NAACP, um, you know, I have spoken to key leaders, and we are uh, basically in support of the different social agenda. Uh, uh, like one of the social agenda that we have been working on uh, is the agenda of the stop and frisk issue. Uh, we feel that um, uh, you know the issue of stop and frisk is 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 a, is a real issue in the Bronx. It's affecting a lot of our youth, and um, and through other organizations and leaders, uh, we have also been out there. Making sure that we that we are that we are bringing that voice of justice uh, for our youth. Right. And what are your views on land use and economic development in the Bronx? Well, I I, I lived in a, an apartment that's basically um, considered to be to be a mixed income um, housing unit, and I think that uh, in order for the working poor to have access to good quality of of, of um, affordable housing that the um, a mixed income housing uni units are a, a good way to go. Uh, I feel that more affordable housing should be created in the Bronx. I feel that um, uh, right now the ho housing court, I understand that uh, an organization called New Settlement, uh, and they have, an or uh, they have a uh, committee which is called CASA. Right now they are conducting an evaluation in terms of identifying the issues that are affecting Bronx residents when they um, when they go to the housing court. So I just think that, you know, with the issue, the issue of housing in general, we have, a, we have a lot of work to do there. You know, but we do need right. affordable housing. All right. Okay. So about, tell me about the 16th district. Well, the, the, the key thing that I want you to know about the 16th district is that it represents, uh, it's part of the poorest congressional district, um, meaning that because of that, we have a lot of needs in the community. And, um, you know, I strongly believe that it's time for a fresh start um, uh, the system council district, uh, a lot of, of our um, um, uh, individuals there, they are confronting a lot of issues such as, uh, you know, we mentioned the education. Uh, uh, we have a high percentage of um, single parents. Um, crime is up 
on that particular area, so we have to address that issue, as well as the issue of um, uh, making sure that people get jobs. You know, a lot of people are really, you know, it's very difficult to get jobs nowadays. So, you know, those are the issues that I'm going to address once I, um, with the help of God, and the help and the willingness of the community. Once I go to City Hall, we're gonna be yeah. working very hard to make sure that we bring uh, services to the community. Okay, now who held the seat that you're currently running for? Uh, it was held, it's actually held right now uh, by um, the Councilwoman Helen Diane Foster. Okay, and is she currently, gonna, is she gonna run again? Or? Well, you know, uh, she's not gonna run again because of term limits and, you know, we do that, we do have a lot of candidates that are seeking to represent that area and um, I, um, I think that this is an exciting year. Uh, we're gonna have uh, a new mayor, we're gonna have new council members and um, it's time for a change. You know, people are gonna have the opportunity to, um, to uh, basically go out and choose their new leaders. I'm hoping to be the, the leader that they're gonna choose uh, based on what I have done for the community, based on, on my record, uh, um, based on um, my involvement at the city university, based on, on me being part of the community. I actually went to school in the neighborhood. I went to Taft High School, and um, I am now back in the neighborhood helping people out, making sure that people elevate themselves. All right, how excited are you at the prospect of being a New York City Council member? Oh, I'm extremely excited. Um, just having the opportunity to be with the new leadership that's gonna be leading uh, the city of New York is very exciting to me. And um, I'm looking forward, definitely. Okay, so are there any other issues you feel need to be addressed in the Bronx? Well, the Bronx, uh, particularly the area that I'm seeking to represent is, um, uh, like I said before, is, is, is confronting a lot of social issues. Um, uh, but um, the uh, key issues, the issue of when it comes to health, the issue of mental health, diabetes, uh, the issue of asthma, those are issues that I'm going to be uh, fighting, uh, the issue of education. Uh, my son is going to a public school. We, not, we have to make sure that we held the elected official accountable, especially the new mayor, and that we, you know, through the new leadership that in, in, indeed we, we do um, um, present the community, especially the working poor, uh, with the path to having a sound basic education for all the kids, you know, all mm -hmm. the kids. That's very important to me. Okay, so do you have a message for Bronx residents? Oh yeah, the message is civic engagement. Uh, we have people that have died for civic engagement. We have to uh, answer to the call of uh, John F. Kennedy when he once said, you know, ask now where you, where your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We have to make sure that people get involved civically, that people go out and vote. We saw it at the national level when, you know, uh, uh, hundreds and, and thousands of people came out and voted for President Obama. We have to make sure that we bring those changes locally. It's time for a fresh start. Um, and I'm very excited, you know, I think that this new year, or actually the next year is gonna be a new year okay. for the people of the Bronx and especially for the people of the city of New York. Okay, so how do people get in contact with you? Well, they can get in contact with me by visiting my webpage, which is votesierra.com, 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 votesierra.com. Okay, any Facebook, Twitter accounts? Oh or? yeah, definitely. I'm very good with social media. We have a Facebook account, we have a Twitter account, LinkedIn account, so they can definitely Google my name and my name is gonna pop up and they're gonna have a way to contact me through the social media, that's for sure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sierra. Thank you for, for joining us me. on the Bronx Journal. We'll be right back with more of the Bronx Journal. Brandon. My name's Brandon. Nine years old, being alcoholic. Hi, Brandon. I'll start drinking with the older kids. And whatever they do, I'll do. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. I know I'll start with alcohol. 
I'm just not sure how it's going to end. Hi, and welcome back to the Bronx Journal. My name is Raisa Parera. Bomba Yo is a youth project dedicated to preserving the rich Afro-Puerto Rican tradition known as Bomba, which is a musical experience that unites singers, drummers, and dancers. Jose Ortiz, a.k.a. Dr. Drum, is a Bronx native and self-taught percussionist of Afro-Caribbean rhythms. For many years, he has been involved with numerous after-school programs and continues teaching workshops throughout New York City, introducing his students to the energy of the Puerto Rican Bomba. Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I guess we can start a little bit. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you were introduced to music. Well, um, how I, I was introduced to music. Or oh, I, I guess Bomba specifically. Yeah. Well, it started with the drum. And the first sounds, uh, I remember I was, it was the age of four uh, in Claremont where I heard the sound of drums and I ran across the street and got, and got hit by a car in 1963. And so that was my first introduction to drumming. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, that's how it all happened. And that I grew up always with that desire to drum. Cool. So, um, why do they call you Dr. Drum? Is was it inspired by your work? Well, um, it was actually it derived from my my upbringing, the lack of um, what I didn't get growing up. Um, I wind up finding a way to do it with the youth a as an adult. And that started in 1999. And um, I went out during the summer and started drumming with the kids in the park. And there was a sense of um, healing from that experience. And I saw myself helping kids, but at the same time I'm helping myself and recapture something that I lost growing up. Yeah. And so I woke up one morning and I just said, I'm Dr. Drum. Nice, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So I guess we can say, what exactly is Bomba? I guess for people who don't really are familiar with it or don't know anything about it, like I guess if you were selling someone for the first time, like what is Bomba? What is Bomba? It's a good question, um, but there's no one answer to that, right? And so I think that's where I would like to kind of set the tone first is to you know, for our audience to understand that there's no one answer to Bomba. You know, um, there are many uh, variations of that, right? But what it is for, for Puerto Rico, right, it is the oldest um, African-derived music, musical genre in the island. And, and so a lot that, you know, that happened afterwards that whatever we're doing today, a lot of it was inspired from those rhythms. So for Puerto Rico, bomba is not just a musical component, but it's part of our identity. So yeah, you know, it's, it's and later on, if we get a chance, we'll get to see how the, the, the drums, yeah. the, the barrel drums and, and those sounds. And, and so you will see that we, there's something different about the sound of bomba, right? Um, so yeah, so yeah, so to keep it all in a nutshell, it's, it, it's it's a music that was that came from uh, an oppressed society of the enslaved Africans. That uh, this was a form of expression to relief, to remember, right? Um, but it has evolved through, from that yeah. time to now, right? And so today, it's 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 a, a living it's a living tradition for us, um, and it's a way to remember about our history, but also to continue that. Right? Yeah, I think so. I guess that ties into that question, like why do you think many Puerto Ricans are not aware of their mm -hmm. African roots or Taino roots as well? Well, that's, that's a tough, that's a, it's a good question and it, it, and there's, uh, it takes time to answer that also, but yeah, it, it comes from our history on the island and how part of that uh, was part of the oppressor. Um, you know, Bomba was, was regulated in the 1800s, and for a lot of reasons. Part of it was even what happened after the Haitian Revolution. So you see, there's many ways of understanding Bomba and, and, and how it affected our lives uh, on the island. And so being regulated and what happened after that, it became a thing where eso no se hace, mm -hmm. right? And so this, this culture of because that's another culture of denying your, your roots, 
right? Uh, this is what happened here in Puerto Rico. It didn't happen here. We're not disconnected because it happened here. It happened already. It was already happening. It's part of our way of being. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a challenge bringing that out in the open today. Um, it's still new information. Yeah. And so we're learning that now. Yeah, we were talking about that because my, even my family still does that, and I know they did it years ago, so I know it's something that doesn't, it hasn't really changed that much from there until now. Yes, so. which uh, that famous poem uh, uh, um, by uh, Vizcarondo, uh, y tu abuela, ¿dónde está? Right? Um, talking about a, a, a grandmother who's black, but, you know, uh, everyone in the front line was white, right? Mm -hmm. So they hit her in the back room, right? Yeah. So this this is what we're talking about, this denial of our blackness. So Bomba plays a big part in that. So um, how does Bomba Yo benefit our youth today? Wow. How it benefits our youth. Um, well, one thing that went, you know, we all have our way, we all have our agenda. Um, and when I talk about we all, I'm talking about Bomba practitioners. You know, um, there's several us out here that are teaching Bomba, and we all have our different angles. You know, one thing that, that for me, um, and what ha Bomba has done for me personally, and so that's what I teach, my personal experience. And what happened was, I really did not know about my Puerto Ricanness and my history until I started doing Bomba. And that experience itself was something big for me, mm -hmm. and so that's what I give to the youth. And what I have seen, what happened through Bon Bayo, you know, those members, those founding members are in college today, you know, and they did it through Bon Bayo. And how does the community benefit from the workshops that you do? Well, um, we're talking about awareness of self, right? We're talking about validating, uh, placing value in our identity, right? I, this is one of our biggest issues in our community that I think that even politicians having a, a problems dealing with don't understand what our community needs yeah. and their needs, right? And so we're trying to fix things from this perspective here, right? Whereas we know that there's already issues and there's problems. Um, because I didn't grow up learning Puerto Rican history. Yeah. I learned about, you know, American history here, right? Uh, um, and so this is what's been the problem. We never valued ourselves. So how are we going to have a healthy community if we don't know who we are? Exactly. And so this is why Bomba, you know, for many, it may be an entertainment, a musical piece. But for us Puerto Ricans that do not know about Bomba, it's our education. And we need to have, we need to have that education so that we can move forward. Okay, cool. Yes. So when we come back, Bomba Yale will have a performance for us. lose their babies to gun crimes. You'll always be your mother's baby. So before you commit a gun crime, think about who you'll leave behind. Gun crimes hit home.
Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Great job. So can you tell everybody where they can contact you? Yeah, um, bombayo.org. And stay tuned for more Bronx Journal. When I have an asthma attack, I feel scared. Sometimes my parents have to take me to the hospital. I feel like a fish with no water. You know how to react to their asthma attacks. Here's how to prevent them. Call 1-866-NO-ATTACKS. Visit www.noattacks.org or call your doctor. Because even one attack is one too many. Hmm. What the heck is this thing? Back fat. Someone must have lost it eating a smaller sized popcorn. Give me that. Hello, welcome back to the Bronx Journal. I am Adavi Gutierrez. Robert Rios is a Bronx singer and songwriter who fuses R&B and Latin soul music to create a new sound of his own. He has steadily gigged in clubs around New York City and recorded several independent albums. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here with us. Now getting right into it, who is Robert Rios? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, Robert Rios is the offspring of Robert Rios the second and the first so <laughs> technically I'm the third I'm so awesome that there's two more of me nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, really I'm a second generation Puerto Rican from the Bronx my grandfather was uh, uh, heavily involved in the Latin music scene up in the like 50s and 60s into the 70s and even at 76 years old he still actively gets gigs today really? um, so really, music has always kind of been ingrained in my family and in my being. So um, I've been steadily hitting the New York City club scene for about, I'd say, about five to six years seriously. But I mean, music has been something that I've always been working on. Um, I was a performer of, and graduate of the uh, LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts. 
Okay. So I was kind of really where it all started about 15 years ago, more or less. Okay, you don't want to tell your age, right? Yeah, it's all right, you know. <laughs> okay, so would you say your grandfather has been a huge role model in your music? Definitely, still to this day. Um, you know, he's always kind of giving me advice on, you know, the right thing to do and kind of steering me and just to stay humble, keep me grounded. Nice. Um, how would you classify your music? Uh, it's definitely more of like an R&B soul type thing. Um, I've always kind of geared towards that. I mean, it's definitely easier for Latin artists to kind of go to that Spanish music route, but something for me, I mean, being that music, uh, English is my first language, and mm -hmm. I've always kind of been, you know, more geared towards that, you know, kind of softer, smoother type of, of sounds. I mean, I'm, I'm especially from my father's playing uh, records uh, growing up, you know, from the doo-wop ages, Motown, and um, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, stuff like that. So it's always kind of been my niche to, like, really kind of fortify the whole genre of Latin R&B artists. Okay, so would you say that you're like jazzy, um, love, you talk about love, relationships, is that kind of like the message in your music? Uh, well, I mean, there's a little bit of everything, I guess. Um, I mean, definitely more of, you know, on the love songs. I mean, I'm a sucker for a good love song. Uh, there's, it's, there's some like more conscientious material like with a message um, and then of course you know your party songs and such like that okay and tell me a little bit about your extended plays your albums or things that you have released uh, well I've done a few EPs that I've done pretty much released online and exclusively through various social media outlets um, I have a website Robert Rios dot net um, and you can reach me on the social media at Rob, uh, Rob Rios Music on Facebook, on Reverb Nation, and Twitter. Uh, I've kind of, over the last, let's say, about since about 2006, 2007 is when I really started to formulate my own sound and start to put together different projects. So I've, I've, I've released independently about four different EPs over the time. Um, currently, I'm working on uh, switching up the vibe from doing more uh, production-wise be beats to a live band. So that's kind of where the next phase is going towards. Okay, and have you? What has been your growth over the years? You say you started in '06, and it's, we're in 2013. So what would you say will be your growth? Like, what was your hiatus or your best part? Well, I definitely think that just it's taken me a while to just really fine tune my sound to where I've really come into my own, where I, you know, they c people can say that I kind of sound like this person or kind of sound like that person, but when you listen to my music, you can definitely s see that it's my own and it's not really trying to sound like anybody else. There's definitely influences of, you know, of d different artists, but, you know, it's definitely something that's not really been heard yet. So it's, it's kind of a good thing. Nice. So we can expect something different, something new. A little something different. Okay. Who have you worked with um, in the industry or out of the industry, up and coming? Like, who have who have you partnered up with? Primarily, um, throughout the whole journey, I've, I've collaborated with a local composer, uh, Ruben Blaze Gonzalez, who's going to be playing guitar for me later on. Um, We've kind of worked together closely over the years and, you know, through that whole process, even just from kind of going from, you know, the kind of more R&B pop stuff and the production stuff to where we are now, where as far as like doing more instrumental and live stuff. So it's kind of getting back to the roots of doing kind of music in its fundamental form. Okay, and how, how, is that, how does that differ from, from doing more poppy sounds or like auto tunes like what we have today than doing like live bands and having like a, target, a guitarist and drums and things like that? Well, I mean, you can't fake it. Like, I mean, definitely auto tune is there. Um, you know, personally, I'm not a big fan of the auto tune. Um, it's, it's kind of turned into a gimmick where you have people that really aren't singers that are now yeah. saying trying to come <laughs> up with full albums that where they're singing i mean yeah it's cool for you know as far as selling and you know just to kind of fun, uh, to kind of make the trend but i mean there's there's no mistaking someone who has talent who can actually use their voice the way that it's been given to them and you know command the stage and you know really take hold of an audience so it's um it's I, I tend to really be more on the lines of you know wanting to do 
get like I said, get back to more of like that music where you know you have a band in front of you and you have like people that are actually there up there playing music and making music and you know it it, it kind of just to me gives it a more well-rounded a uh, feel. Now you was talking about natural talent and you will be performing for us today, right? Yeah, from uh, one of my newer songs of, of the upcoming project. It's I've kind of done a few different versions of it over the last, I'd say about a year, but um, now that we're kind of gearing towards that live band setup, this is kind of more along the sound that I've really heard for it. When it's kind was of one that I wanted to kind of redo a couple of times just to get it right. What's the name of it? Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Work Hard. How oh, nice, and I love to work hard. <laughs> and we will be back for more of the Bronx Journal and Robert will be performing for us after this break. We can all be more energy efficient. It's easy. <laughs> Use energy saving light bulbs. <laughs> energy smart power strips. And turn off electronics and appliances when not in use. <laughs> Learn what you can do today at energy.gov slash tink. I'm on the clock as it goes round. There's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, no, never enough. I work hard on my grind, sunrise to sunrise. Bitch, I'm on the clock as it goes round. There's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, no, never enough. Seconds, minutes, hours passing, days go on so everlasting. I'll be losing count, but I know I must keep up. Hit the ground running, set the pace before me Won't ever stop, no, won't cease I'ma keep going till there's no more left in me No, I won't back down I will stand my ground And the world can just keep moving right below my two feet I work hard for a living, you got to believe in my soul, blood, sweats, and tears. And I won't be dismissed, given the business. No, you can't ever stop this. Work hard on my ground, sunrise, sunrise, which I'm on the clock. Yeah. As it goes around, there's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, no, never enough. I work hard on my ground, sunrise, sunrise, which I'm on the clock. Yeah. As it goes around, there's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, no, never enough. From the sun. To the sunlight, day and night, the time goes by. From the sunrise to the sunlight, day and night, the time goes by. Day in, day out, clock in, clock out, the hustle starts here with me. Oh, work more play, I won't miss a thing to lumber six feet deep. No matter what you throw at me, it won't deter me from my dreams. Unlimited, my will and spirit won't let me give in. Because all the world is a stage, and I won't ever miss a beat. Set the battles on, and the line's been drawn, now the rest is up to me. In the midst of what the world may dish, it won't be my defeat that you won't see. Sunrise, sunrise, which I'm on the clock as it goes around. There's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, never enough. I work hard on my ground. Sunrise, sunrise, which I'm on the clock as it goes around. There's never enough time, never enough time, never enough, never enough. From the sunrise to the sunlight, day and night, the time goes by. From the sunrise to the sun. Day and night, the time goes by. Never enough, never enough. Oh, no, there's never enough, no, never enough.
thank you guys for performing. That was awesome. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Ruben, for coming on the show. And where can people find more about you? Well, you can go online and hit me up on the website, robertrios.net. Like Skynet, we've taken over. Or just hit me up through social medias, at Rob Rios Music on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again for that information. And we'll be back with another edition of the Bronx Journal. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome.